The world of investing and finances is so much more complicated than it needs to be, which is why I made this channel to make investing simplified. So in this video, I'm gonna take a bunch of terms that are probably overcomplicated and something that you may not even understand fully and just try to simplify it as simple as possible. And if there's a specific term or idea that I don't go over in this video, go ahead and throw it down in the comment section below and I'll put together a follow-up video or a part two to this investing simplified terms. The first term is capital gains. We're all in the stock market to make money, but how does it actually work? A capital gain refers to the increase in the value of a capital asset when it's sold. Put simply, a capital gain occurs when you sell an asset for more than you originally paid for it. So if you buy a stock for $100 and it goes up to $110, then you sell it at that point, you've made a capital gain of $10. It also works the other way where if you would have bought that stock at $100 and you sell it at $90, now you have a loss of $10. Next would be compound interest or compound growth. Compound interest is interest calculated on both the initial principal and all of the previously accumulated interest. Generating interest on interest is known as the power of compound interest. This is huge and this is what got me originally excited to invest early on. Regular interest, like in a savings account, let's say that you had $10,000 and you get 10% interest. First of all, 10% interest in a savings account would be crazy, but just stick with me. 10% interest on $10,000 is $1,000. So over 20 years, you will have gained $20,000 of interest on that original capital, on that 10,000. So at the end of 20 years, you will have had 10,000 that you put in plus 20,000 of interest, which would be $30,000 total. That's regular interest. But compound growth or compound interest, you get to make interest on the interest. So if you were to get 10% in a compound interest format, you wouldn't just be making 10% on that $10,000 you'd be making 10% on the $10,000 plus the 10% that it made, plus the 10% that it made and it keeps going. If you were to put $10,000 in and get 10% compound interest for 20 years, now you'd have $67,275. That's more than double just putting it in a regular interest account. When we talk about the S&P 500 or other ETFs or index funds that make compound interest or compound growth really, that's what we mean. Next is this idea of dollar cost averaging, or you might see it as DCA. Dollar cost averaging is the practice of systematically investing equal amounts of money at regular intervals, regardless of the price of a security. The way to practically do this is just basically every time you get paid, you put a certain amount of money into the stock market and into whatever ETF or stocks that you've chosen. If it's this S&P 500 and your dollar cost averaging, every two weeks or every month or whenever you're putting $100 or $200 or whatever in no matter what. Doesn't matter if the price is up or the price is down. You're basically going to get it at an average as it's going up or as it's going down, which has its pros and cons either way. The opposite of dollar cost averaging is called timing the market and few, if any, actually can do this correctly. Statistically, dollar cost averaging is the way to go. Next is this idea of the debt market versus the equity market. All this basically means is that there's different ways that you can be investing your money or diversifying your funds. First, debt market instruments like bonds are loans, while equity market instruments like stocks are ownership in a company. In returns, debt instruments pay interest to investors, while equities provide dividends or capital gains. Basically the difference between a bond or a stock. And again, both of these have different pros and cons as well. The next term is called ticker symbol. And this is just what you'll look up when you're wanting to buy the certain stock or ETF. For Apple, there's is APL. For Nvidia, it's NVDA. For an ETF that tracks the S&P 500 from Vanguard, it's VOO. For an ETF that tracks the S&P 500 from State Street, it's SPLG. This is just a way for you to look up that stock and be able to do some research and then eventually be able to buy it. Next is called share price. If you notice just now, I showed you two ETFs that both track the S&P 500. So this means that they track the exact same index, the exact same thing, but they're different funds. One is almost $500 and the other is only $60 or so. So is the cheaper one better? No, however much the share price is compared to another stock or ETF, 
does not mean that it's more expensive or cheaper than that other ETF. Yes, it's more dollar amount for you to buy one full share of it, but at the end of the day, if you were to buy VU, you now have about $500 in the S&P 500. If you were to buy SPLG, you have about $60 in the S&P 500. It's just the total amount invested in the underlying index, especially when we're talking about ETFs. But just because a stock might be $1,500 to buy one versus a different stock that costs you $8, doesn't mean that one is better than the other just based off of the price alone. The next term on this list is called stock price appreciation. This is just a fancy way of saying that the stock has gone up or how much the stock has gone up in price. If you bought the stock at $50 and now it's worth 55, the stock has appreciated $5 since you've owned it. Next is this idea of a dividend. A company stock may offer a dividend and to figure out how much, you need to go to its stock summary page. Each year the company will declare what the stock amount will be and usually this is paid out quarterly. If a company says that they're gonna give out a $4 dividend yearly, this means $1 per quarter. If the company had a stock price of $100 and it says it's gonna give out a $4 yearly dividend, this means it'll be giving a 4% dividend yield since $4 is 4% of 100. This is where some investors get in trouble because they're only looking at the dividend yield and they're only buying into the stock because of a high dividend yield percentage. If this company told us they're giving $4 dividend yearly and their company does poorly for a couple months and now the stock price is at 50 $50, the dividend yield would now be 8%. The 8% dividend yield sounds very nice, but what actually happened to your money is you put $100 in and then the stock price dropped to 50. So in essence, you kind of lost $50 in order to get that 8% dividend yield. Now, yes, you don't lose any money until you sell, but if a company drops half of its value, it's probably not looking too good for that company not looking too good for your investment. When I look at dividend paying stocks, I like to look at stocks that have been paying a dividend for a long period of time, hopefully growing that dividend over time, but also that their share price has risen as well. This next term is called stock split, and it's a big one if you've been following stocks at all, especially in the last week or two with this big Nvidia stock split. But all this means is that the pizza is being cut in more slices. Think about it, you can have a pizza and it could have eight slices. Then you could go in and you can cut each slice in half and now you have 16 slices in that pizza. But at the end of the day, you still have one pizza. Doesn't matter how we cut it up. The stock itself is not worth any more or any less as far as value is concerned because the company just issued more stocks so that they could bring down the overall share price. You could have 10 stocks at $10 or you could have one stock at $100 and there's still the same amount of value that you're invested in that one company. Nvidia just split 10 for one. Their stock price was around $1,200 for one stock and now their stock is 10 times less per share at just $120. If someone owned one Nvidia stock last week at 1,200, they now own 10 Nvidia stocks at 120 per piece. Index fund versus ETF. The biggest difference between them is that ETFs trade intraday at various prices during exchange hours and index mutual funds can be bought or sold only after the market closes each day at a fund's net asset value. Especially if you're gonna be investing long term, the difference between the two is very, very minimal, if anything. For all intents and purposes, you can just think of them as basically the same thing. So what about the difference between a bull market and a bear market? Very simply, bull market means positive or market going up, bear market means bad or market going down. Next is the dip, or what you're probably gonna hear is buy the dip. Stocks and ETFs hopefully keep going up, but inevitably there's going to be times when they do drop. If something drops substantially, like 10% or 20%, that's considered a big dip. Mathematically, you're gonna profit the most when you buy at the lowest and then it goes back up. So if you're able to buy right at that dip and then it goes back up, you will have made a bunch of money. The only problem is that sometimes it may look like this is a dip, but then it just keeps going down. So you have to know the difference between 
is this a dip or is this stock or company just going out of business and this is a bad time to be buying? For solid ETFs and things that I talk about on this channel, there is gonna be times that the market dips and then goes right back up, just like it has historically for many, many years, like the S&P 500. Next is this idea of treasuries or bonds. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills are three different types of US debt securities. They vary in their length to maturity, the time it takes to receive the face value and the interest rates they pay. Treasury bills mature in less than one year, treasury notes in two to five years, and treasury bonds in 20 or 30 years. The easiest way to buy treasury bonds, notes, and bills are directly from the US government as treasurydirect.gov or through a broker. You can also be invested in bonds and probably are in your 401k or in your investment accounts through an ETF or a mutual fund that tracks these bonds. And bonds are usually a good way to stabilize your money. They're definitely less volatile than stocks, but they're also not going to grow very much. So it's not really the way that you're going to build wealth, but it could be the way that you preserve your wealth. Next is a HYSA or a high yield savings account. And this is just almost exactly the same thing as your savings account that you have now. Say you have an account at Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, it's just a regular savings account. But in that savings account, you get a little bit of interest, like 0.01% or maybe up to 0.15% if they're feeling generous. In a high yield savings account, it's exactly like the name says. Instead of you getting that little 0.01%, you're getting something like 4.5% or something crazy. The way that they're able to do that is because they're mostly online and so they don't have as much overhead as a regular bank. Think of Chase and Wells Fargo, they have tellers and they have physical locations. If they don't have to have all of that and they can just give you more of their profit, that's what they're gonna do in order to entice you to put your money there. For a high yield savings account, just like a regular savings account, as long as it's guaranteed and insured, which you definitely wanna check, your money is safe and it can't drop. It's not like the stock market where you're putting it in and there's a possibility that it could drop. In a savings account, it's gonna stay there, but then they're gonna give you that interest on top of it. My favorite right now is Capital One, the 360 account, and then also Ally is a good one as well. A high yield savings account right now is a great option for you to get a guaranteed four to 5% on your money, just to let it sit there, especially as we see what happens in the stock market over the next couple months. The next term is blue chip stock. Blue chip stock is a stock from a company with a large market capitalization, a long history of growth, and a place in a major market index. Blue chip stocks are well established, have strong financial numbers, and often have name recognition. These would be companies like Coca-Cola or Home Depot or Amazon. They've been around for a long period of time. They're not really at risk of just dying out. And overall, they're a little bit safer than some of these other ones that are new and much smaller. Next two terms are different ways that you can invest or different strategies within the stock market. The first one is dividend investing. And this was the whole idea of building out a whole portfolio of stocks or ETFs that spit out a dividend every quarter or every year. The thing that I like about dividend investing is that you buy an asset and then it gives you that dividend and you can assume that you're going to be getting that every quarter forever as long as they don't cut the dividend. Keep in mind that companies can cut their dividend so it's a good idea for you to make sure that you stick with safe, blue chips type dividend stocks, especially ones in the list of dividend kings or dividend aristocrats. But I like dividend investing so much because if you build this thing up big enough, you might be able to just live off of that dividend forever and never even have to sell any shares. And so not only will you be able to live off those dividends, you can then pass that down to future generations or to charity later on in life. The next type of strategy for investing would be growth investing. And this is a different strategy where the whole idea is price appreciation, like we talked about from before. You're investing in fun, crazy stocks and companies and ETFs that should grow at a lot faster of a rate than regular companies. This would be something like Nvidia or Tesla or Amazon back in the day. The whole idea here is to buy in at a certain share price. Hopefully it appreciates much faster. You gain a lot more money. Then you will need to sell off those shares in order to actually realize the profit. But it's a great way to try to make a little extra money faster. Next term on this list is PE ratio or price to earnings ratio. The PE ratio is calculated by dividing the market value price per share by the company's earnings per share. A high PE ratio can mean that a stock's price is high relative to earnings and possibly overvalued. 
A low PE ratio might indicate that the current stock price is low relative to earning. When I'm looking at stocks and ETFs, I like to see PE ratios under 20, for sure under 30. Right now, Nvidia's up over 70, which is just crazy. But then again, a lot of analysts still think that that company has a lot of room to grow. And I kind of believe that. So price to earnings ratio is a great metric to look at, but it's not necessarily the whole picture. This next term gets a lot of heat and a lot of people are either on one side or the other, and this would be diversification. Put simply, this just means spreading out your risk. This could mean within the stock market or just investing overall. So investing overall would look like you have a little bit of money in stocks and a little bit of money in real estate and maybe in business ventures or crypto or whatever else it may be and not just all of your money only in stocks. For the stock market, this means that we don't wanna only be invested in the very fun companies like the tech companies like Amazon and Nvidia and Microsoft alone. You probably also wanna hold some Procter & Gamble and Home Depot and Coca-Cola other companies that are gonna give you more of a holistic approach to being able to get different sectors so that you're not overweighted in any one area. The best way to diversify in a very strong, solid format would be through ETFs and specifically the ETFs that I talk about a lot on this channel. You also need to know the correct order to be investing because you don't wanna put all of your money into something when it should be somewhere else and that's what's gonna get you the most optimal long-term. Watch this video to figure out the best order in which you should be investing and where you should be putting your money as you go or watch this video for the only three fun portfolio you'll ever need.